WNYC-TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and... I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein, and our guest today is that preeminent force in the American theater, Joseph Papp, the founder of the New York Shakespeare Festival and the public theater. It wasn't always called the Shakespeare Festival, and it wasn't always quite the way it is today. About 25 years ago, at the Emanuel Presbyterian Church on the Lower East Side, I guess was the first performance of the festival, an evening with Shakespeare in Marlowe. How did you manage to convince the people of New York that we could not exist without free Shakespeare? What's the genesis and the evolution of the New York Shakespeare Festival? Well, it goes back to my birth, I think, to start with. First of all, New York, I was born here. So I had a, I always had a good feeling about the city. I, got, I know the city, I know the people in the city. And uh, I lived in so many areas of the city, both, you know, black, Hispanic, Jewish, Mohammedan, Italian, Irish. I, I used the parks a lot when I was a kid. We were very poor, so. I got a sense of the city. I don't know how I convinced anybody of anything. The point is, I convinced myself first that what I was doing is something I wanted to do and had some importance for the city. And uh, I guess once you, you uh, convince yourself, then uh, that's the beginning, to convince other people. But remember, the first four or five years, there was no money. Only people who actually made it possible were the actors and technicians who just contributed their own time and in many cases, their money. You may have been avant-garde street enhancers, as I recall. You would also pass the hat, so to speak, to collect money from... Uh, well, yeah, I was arrested twice for doing that in Central Park. Uh, I was told that you can't, you can't collect money on city property. And the sergeant said, if you get up there again, he says, uh, Mr. Papp, he said, I'm going to take you in. I got up, he took me in. Come up the next night, I got up there again took me in again. I said, listen, I got to make, I mean, you have to pay for this thing. I said, you know, stop arresting me so I can do, raise some money. He says, well, you, said, you can't raise money in the park. So I said, well, where can I ask for money? Well, there are four corners. They're all park property. There are three of them are park property, but the northwest corner was not. So I used to say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not allowed to raise money here in the Central Park. See? So if you're on your way out, there'll be a big basket on the northwest corner <laughs> of 81st Street in Central Park West. Would you mind dropping some money in it? And we, we collect as much as maybe $75 some night on a good night. Kept you going. Well, it sure did. Kept you going to the extent that Richard Eder, the New York Times drama critic, has called the festival and it's his words, the single most important and flourishing theatrical institution in the country. Oh, I agree with him 100%. Well, there are lots of other people that do too, but how far flung are your enterprises these days? Well, first of all, uh, you, we have shows on Broadway. We have Chorus Line and uh, Runaways on Broadway. We just had Colored Girls for Colored Girls because it's suicide and the rainbow is enough on Broadway. That's now touring. The fact that both, both Colored Girls and, um, and Chorus Line are playing in Washington side by side, one at the, uh, the new, newly saved National Theater that was going to go down, and the Warner Theater. And then we have the public theater downtown on Lafayette Street, which is in the village. I have seven theaters there. The small ones. In Seven which theaters contained within that building. Within, within one structure. It was the original Astor Library that was, uh, you know, built by John Jacob Astor uh, before the Civil War. Then after the Civil War, it was built in ten years sections. It's quite a lovely building. It's a landmark building. We saved it from the demolition, and it's a thriving institution. It's very much alive. And in this place, we do plays. We have uh, music. I'm going to talk about modern music, real way out jazz, new jazz. Uh, we have films that have been artistic uh, successes and financial failures. Uh, mostly we do plays, and uh, we're doing quite a number of works now. We have a black Hispanic musical that the Ray Ramirez has, is, is, has written. We've been working on that for 18 months. That is a new company, the Black Hispanic Company. It's two things. One is, one is a musical work, which was written by a Hispanic, and the other is a work written by an Englishman called William Shakespeare. We have a company that's doing two plays of Shakespeare. Uh, this, one is the Black Hispanic Company is doing two performances. Two plays of Shakespeare. Mm -hmm. Actually, they'll be working, they'll be doing, working six months together on the project. We have 12 weeks rehearsal. And we're doing uh, Julius Caesar and Coriolanus. They're both political plays, deal with democracy and dictatorship, the fickleness of the mob, so to speak. It makes you reevaluate your feelings about democracy watching those two plays. We have some of the finest uh, black and Hispanic actors in this company. And uh, uh, it's, uh, there, are no, there are no whites in the company. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, 
See, for years we've been we've been doing we've been doing uh, we've been mixing our company. I was the first one to begin to use black actors in in Shakespeare. And James Earl Jones began to work with me. He was the first black actor to work with me, and Roscoe Lee Brown. And uh, originally, so uh, they play major roles. Bobby Hooks played Henry V. But I found myself. We we had a King Lear with the uh, three daughters being black, and finally I found myself. I said, I don't like this because it's. Uh, it's so like token casting, even though it wasn't just one. Sometimes you'd have to develop an idea for how to use blacks in certain groups and so forth, and Hispanics in a certain way. And I felt, I'm tired of that. And I, I, thought, I thought integration could be very boring on the stage. And I decided integration is fine for society, but it's not so great on the stage. So I decided, one, I'd create a company of black actors who've worked with me over the years, most of them. And uh, because there was also a common cultural experience, a certain kind of energy, and a certain kind of finesse that people are, can handle the language and so forth. And we're getting some pretty good shows. Is the director happens to be white, incidentally. It's Michael Langham, he's an Englishman, directing this uh, company. Is that part of your reevaluation of democracy, segregation? Oh, I'm always reevaluating democracy. You know, re democracy can, can, can kill you, particularly in the theater. <laughs> you know, you have to be very, very careful that you don't have too many opinions. Uh, on artistic, Nothing was on ever done by points. a committee? Impossible. I mean, Lincoln Center now has just formed I'm a committee. Going to ask They call it a directorate with five people who, don't, who couldn't sit in the same room together. And that's going to be their answer? No. You see, there's going to be another man who's, who selected that committee. And then there's a man who selected that man who selected that committee. Watch out for that man. He has, he, has, he, has, he has the name the third, somebody the third. Watch out for him. Because this is the man that came out against barons in the theater. You know what he means by barons? Artistic leaders in the theater. In other words, George Balanchine would be a, would be a baron. Stanislavski would be a baron. Joseph Papp. Joseph Papp would be a baron. You know what I mean? It means, it means that you have an artistic point of view about what you want to do. And you have the control because you have the artistic point of view, because you want to control it. So, so he wants to replace that kind of baron with his baron, B-A-R-R-E-N, thinking, you know, on the subject. But when you get five people, what you do is divide and conquer. You have no, but anyway, there's no money there. But anyway, theaters can't be run by committees. You've had no an experience yourself at Lincoln Center. Yeah, I was there for four years and supported Lincoln Center. We lost two and a half million dollars a year there. The money we got from a chorus line, all the profits went, went to support two years of Lincoln Center. Well, why did you take on that responsibility? Well, because the public theater was owed a million dollars. We were going down. Mm -hmm. I figured, well, if I can get into Lincoln Center, I can raise another four million dollars plus the one million dollars, which I did. And, I, and, I, and I, we got out of the problem at, at, uh, at the public theater. And I went into Lincoln Center, and then I took it on as a challenge. Uh, to see what can be done, see if I turn it around a little bit. I began to do plays that were not the kind of plays usually done in these big institutions. I mean, I did a play like Bo The Boom Boom Room by David Rabe, which was a little, I guess, too risque for a lot of the audience. And uh, I did a play called um, Short Eyes, which had to do with, uh, written by Hispanic, the first Hispanic to win for Puerto Rican. Uh, Pinero. Miguel Pinero, the first and won, won a Drama Critics Award. But it seems awfully strange in that, in that building. Everybody has to be very polite, less like church, you know, when they go to the theater. But I began to turn that around. Before, before I left, did three productions that began to change that space around. It's bad space for theater. Do you built, think the space badly. itself should be remodeled? Oh, sure. Would that be part of the answer? Oh, that's, no, that's part of an answer. But that's about $4 million part of the answer. The ma major problem of any theater, one, is the artistic leadership of the theater. What's mm -hmm. the point of view of the theater? Two, how do you support it? And this current five-man directorate committee? They're all nice people. I know them all. But I never see them in the same room. And what are they going to do? Two of them are working someplace else. Some may come for 30 days. I mean, it's... it's then you it's, have a rather grim prognosis. Oh, I don't... It's just dumb. That whole thing is just dumb. makes no sense at all. Well, also, have, how are they going to support it? Who's after having money? lived through it, what would you propose as a better Well, what you need is a, is, a, is a huge government subsidy to permit uh, certain like people to get together, to create a kind of an ensemble, to work for two or three years together before even going into that place and develop some way of working. So first you're suggesting a repertory company? Yeah, development, oh. a development of a company. But you can't see, the way you develop a company, you can't say, well, I'm going to get him, 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 and her, and her, and her, and put those together, and that's a company. I'll tell you how a company forms. I was at lunch uh, just day before yesterday, and there were about five people there. Uh, Colleen Dewhurst, uh, Jason Robards, uh, and uh, uh, Jose Quintero, myself, and there were two other actors, Jerry and Gerald, so forth. Now, we were sitting at this lunch. Well, why isn't that a company? Well, I'm telling you, that is a company. See? It's already a company. Those five people, plus five more, it becomes a company. They, first of all, they've been together. A lot of them work together and so forth, so there's common artistic kind of understanding of things. That's the beginning of a company. And you just add to that people who have like 
attitudes, like philosophical things, and like, uh, like ideas about art and so forth, you can form a company. And you let them work. You develop, develop a repertoire. Let them work for a couple of years. Why don't you form a company? I am forming a black and Hispanic company. Well, why don't you, in addition to that company, why don't you form a company of working, these other fellows? I am working on that. I'm working on that. For example, I'm doing a play. I have Meryl Streep, uh, uh, Mary Beth Hurt, in a play which we're doing now, a new play by Tom Babe, Elizabeth Wilson. What is that uh, Dixie play? Carter. It's called Taken in Marriage. Now suddenly, I have five women that could be major actresses in a company. And I can get five men. I mean, it's, the way you create a company is, is that you get first-rate first, first rate actors together who really feel want to do something. Now, they're all hot, very hot. I mean, Meryl is going to win an Academy Award for, for her, her picture. And, uh, and so what you have to get people to commit themselves for a period of time. You say, OK, you work a year, and you're not going to do any pictures, right? You get the best actors. And, uh, you get George C. Scott. He should definitely be part of a company. Get him for a year. George C. Scott well, started credits with, you with his, I guess, wider visibility in the first place well, 20 years ago. He started with the festival. He started with us. He played what uh, role did he's he Richard play? III, and then he played uh, Jaquies and As You Like It. It was just brilliant, you know. And he'd never acted in any major company before. And so Colleen Dewhurst, she started with us, too. But great, great numbers of actors. But I'm saying, you, it's, you can put a company together. And uh, then, well, then what's stopping you? Test leadership. First, it's extremely costly to maintain a company. To have a company at the Beaumont will increase that deficit to about another couple of million dollars a year. And, but there's nothing wrong with it. There are theaters all over the world that have that. Uh, only this country, with all its problems and so forth and so on, still has the, has the, has the financial resources to have three or four companies. It shouldn't it doesn't have to be one company. But the uh, Beaumont needs to be run like a, like a regular state theater. It's a big, big monolith. And it's not like the, the Philharmonic. And it's not like the, the Met, which has, which has a long history and, and great means of support. This is a bastard child that came around later on, an afterthought. And they put a board on it. It has no artistic purpose. And this man, what is his name, Samuels III, says, uh, the institution is all. That, that place is all. The building is nothing. It's now standing there big, black, it may as well be charred. The building is a splendid design. It's the, the, the life and the usefulness yeah. that it does the not exist. The exterior of the building is a splendid design. The interior of the building is not very useful for the theater. It needs a total. I have plans, of, I have $35,000 worth of plans already to, re, to redo the interior of that, to make, it, to make it more workable. Do you ever see the possibility of your returning there? I don't see it at the moment, no. I can't see me working there because, you see, when I work at the public theater, I can, I've experiment, I can experiment for 16, 18 months sometimes. Like I, I've done on this play called uh, uh, Sancocho, which means a stew. This is this black, Hispanic, Puerto Rican uh, musical, which uh, Mike Nichols is, will be directing, incidentally. But I've worked on that for a long time. I can't do that there. There you come up to bat all the time, you must be a success. It's like being the Philharmonic. You can't have a bad concert. I mean, you may, may go off a little bit. Or the Met really can't give a bad production. They get the best people. It's a big show, showcase. It's not really a place to develop. It's something that you, you may take something to after it has been developed. By itself, it's not, it's not right. So I don't see myself working there, do you even with a lot of subsidy. Do you see your, the Shakespeare Festival as a place to research and develop and to take plays on someplace else afterwards? Oh, sure. We're, we're like a marvelous handicraft factory down there at the public. We have, seven, we have sometimes seven things going on simultaneously, and you have to get into that lobby to get a sense of what ferment really is, or just walk around during the day and go, go to these various locations. People are rehearsing everywhere. I mean, they're, they're, they're in the lobby, they're in, they're in the green rooms, some of them are in the bathroom. Do you have any open rehearsals? Uh, it depends on the director. Sometimes, if the director feels good about it, okay. But there's a lot of personal things that go on between acting and directors. We don't generally have them. But as a rule, we, we don't have them. It's different for an orchestra. But when you're dealing, you know, very intimately with actors. But occasionally some director doesn't mind. We have a group coming in from Michigan or something, some teachers that mm -hmm. want to get a sense of what the uh, grease paint is all about, and we sort of let them come in. You spent a life in the theater. What is it all about? The th well, it's all about life. Uh, it's all about the way I feel about myself and what, how I feel about society, the way I feel about this city, the way I feel about the people that are working with me, uh, the way I feel the world should be, although it never will be, the way I feel about art, its function, its um, exacerbation of my life. I mean, it's always, there's no success in art, ever. And that's what I love about it. There are temporary satisfactions. There are lots of satisfactions, a lot of glooms, a lot of desperation, a lot of pain with people. Because it's mostly relationships, all of this, with, with talented people. I've seen people climb walls kill themselves, do all kinds of things. But it's the most, it's living life on a very high level. And uh, I want to be able to express that. I want people, I feel in the theater, most theater is less than life. 
You go to the average show, it's less than life. Now, why spend money to go to something that's less than life? Well, you can go out, go to a disco and have more than life when you're doing something yourself. So, uh, so, the, so the theater has that kind of meaning for me. But then there are the people that are in it. I, I have, I have long-term relationships, anywhere from, from, I mean, 15 to 25 years of relationships with people and with people, fresh new people coming in who are 18, 19, 20, 21. They're like, you know, they'd be my kids. And yet, I, they, re, they become colleagues based on their talent. So, so, so I, I don't expect theater to solve any problems in the world, but it solves, they certainly deal with, with things that are very important in life. And it's you know, something that, and, I, and I, don't, I don't like the permanence of film, for example. I mean, I like the things that come and go, it's ephemeral. It's a moment of life and very fresh and very significant for the moment. I hate long runs. They get boring after a while. To housekeep a show, which we have to do, like a chorus line's been running now for almost three years. We, the maintenance on that show is impeccable. We just take care of that because, first of all, it's a very expensive uh, show, and it means, it means it's been supporting us. We've had you know, very little su subsidy from the outside. In fact, the actual amount of money we get from government and from private sources maybe is about 7 or 8%. So about so $4 million a, a year have been coming from that. From, from, from Chorus, from Chorus line, line. Which has been supporting our entire operation. And obviously the line between creativity and solvency is an increasingly difficult one to navigate. But Chorus Line has been your... It's been a, it's been a savior. But we, but we, we spent uh, seven months on developing Chorus Line from nothing. It was just a... Did some, the Shakespeare Festival develop Chorus Line Absolutely. or did Michael Bennett? No, Michael Bennett worked at the, at the Shakespeare Festival. Mm -hmm. It was all done in our theater. Michael Bennett came to me with some tapes he had, recordings of, of dancers that sat around all evening for several evenings discussing their lives. That's what he brought me. Out of that came a chorus line. We started working on it together. Naturally, Michael Bennett is a major artistic force. Mm -hmm. I deal with him. I deal with Michael Nick, Mike Nichols. And people of lesser name, but also of extraordinary talent. Elizabeth Suedos is an extraordinary talent. She's yet to reach, her, reach any place close to what she can do. She's working now in an extraordinary way. But it's what that collaboration that made, that made Chorus Line possible. Chorus Line would not have been possible otherwise. What was your budget, the Shakespeare Festival's budget, for all of these far-flung activities before Chorus Line? Bef Chorus Line... Your annual budget? Uh, roughly, before, well, we, we, we were a million dollars in deficit, so if you want to know our budget, before Chorus Line, we were really in the hole. And uh, we, 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 uh, we were just struggling. I don't know, cliffhanging, mostly. But it would be roughly about two and a half million dollars a year. And what do you see the lifespan of Chorus Line to continue to another provide? Year, another year, we will be a million dollar, we'll have a million dollar deficit, and a year and a half, probably close to two million. And in two years, we'll, we'll have to raise all the money, and three million dollars a year. It's a and lot of money to raise. Yeah, I, but I can't, I can't raise that in the open market. It'll have to be some kind of subsidy. In other words, I have to convince the governor of New York, the mayor of New York, and the federal government that this institution, after 25 years, has a place in the sun here, and needs something to underwrite a good portion of its, of its, of its existence. How much of your funding do you get from the city now? Uh, well, we, we fund the city, in effect. What do you mean? Well, for, yeah, for, for doing... By generating activity. No, but no, by actually raising this... To raise, to do Shakespeare in the Park, the city contributes, has been contributing $340,000. We contribute $500,000, money I have to raise. So we are, we are supporting But that, that is the grant. case with other performing arts institutions as well. Well, not, not in that degree. Do you have a budget know. line in the city, like the Metropolitan Museum or the Zoological no, we, Society? No, we don't have a budget line in the city. Is we that one to, of the things to, that you are... We have are to go for it every year. Uh, I think it should be a state, a state line, a budget line. It should be a state theater at this point. And how do you the propose to do up, about that? I mean, you're an, a great old politician, Joe Papp. I'm not going to be honest with you. I hear that little mumble, but as far you know, back as 1957, yeah. you were the first squatters writers that I had ever you heard of. You just went into Central Park and You went to down. Central Park, your yeah. so-called mobile unit broke down, and there you were in Central Park and decided to claim some turf. I did claim that turf. You sure did. And within four years, you had a Delacorte Theater, and after a court case, Robert Moses asking the Board of Estimate. He turned 90 yesterday. He did indeed. Yeah. Have you become great good friends? No, after? we've never become great good friends. Never become friends. Great or good. Well, you did have a court battle with him, and ultimately, he went to the Board of Estimate to get the funds to build the Delacorte Theater. Yeah, he was crazy. I didn't know why he did that. 
I wasn't even sure I wanted a theater at that time. I wanted to be mobile. I wanted to be come and go. I thought I didn't want to get stuck with the city situation. Maybe Delacroix wanted it. Well, they, no, he helped out. He didn't really want it at the time. I think he spoke to, uh, was it Newbold Morris at the time, who was the uh, then Park commissioner Smith. of parks. So yes, all of that happened. But you know why it happened? All these things happened? The work was good. If the quality of the work were poor, then I couldn't achieve anything. If I feel a play is lousy, I can't raise a penny. I, it takes all the uh, fight out of me. I have to feel that the work is on a high standard and that we are really cutting through in the theater, not just repeating ourselves or doing a show. I mean, I'm not just doing plays. My, everything we do must have a cutting edge. I mean, we, we did the first, the first the Pulitzer Prize black uh, playwright was one of our plays, Charles Gordon, in No Place to Be Somebody. The first Puerto Puerto Rican won Drama Critics Award. We find, we find a lot of plays we do, and uh, then David Rabe, uh, who did the, the, the first major plays on Vietnam. It's, it's just that the, our theater has reflected the times, not by any, you know, going out of way. They still have to be on a high artistic level. And in the current season, how does it reflect the times? Because more and more, in spite of the fact that you do a great deal of experimental work, not only in terms of the economics, but the success of the enterprise demands a Christopher Plummer, a Mike Nichols, a Tony Walton. Not uh, at all. That play failed with all those people. And but I, nonetheless, and then I put on I put on for colored girls who had nobody, nobody, anybody knew, and it was a big success. So it has nothing to do with names, and it doesn't require names at all. Then fact, why did you have all those names down because there? Because they're good. I think Christopher Plummer is a brilliant actor. I'd love to have him work there. And Mike Nichols is one of the great directors mm -hmm. of our country. And to, to, have, to have Edgar Doctorow, who's a fine novelist, write a play was extraordinary. I love that. I don't discriminate against stars, but I don't make that the basis for our, for our operation. Most of the people we have, not, they turn out to be stars. George Scott wasn't a star when he started. Meryl Streep did a first show with us. She was not a star. She's going to be a big star. And uh, so if they turn out to be stars, fine, as long as they keep their heads about them and don't go crazy, you know. So, no, those demands aren't that great. Why would I do a black Hispanic thing at a time when the Bakke case is to do just the opposite? The country's going very conservative. In fact, it was at the time of the Bakke case decision that I decided I'm going to have a black and Hispanic company. I went just the other way, you see. And we were, the, issue, the issue of, of racism, which came up the first two weeks, was immediately dispelled. With. Now, now what we're dealing with is, is quality, the quality and the standard of the work. You want to show your blackness, yes, be good. Be a good actor. If you're a lousy actor, you'll show nothing. Because showing your blackness, showing yourself. That was the, we went through the whole thing on a big, big critical thing. If it had been the 60s, it had been blood on the floor, but there wasn't this time. Do people respond, the audience, to criticism, the work of critics, and is it reflected in audience response the same way in your theaters as it is on Broadway? I'd say for the most part. How much effect, the qu real question is, do critics have on audience uh, turnout? Sometimes extraordinary effect and sometimes nothing. And how do you explain that? It depends on the nature of the show. Getting My Act Together and Taking it On the Road, that's a new work by mm -hmm. Gretchen Cryer and Nancy Ford. It opened at the Public Theater seven months ago. Got mixed to negative reviews. It was a play about a woman who had been a woman's a feminist and suddenly at the age of 39 sees that not, a lot of that is not even working. She's alone. And uh, it's, a, it's a very marvelous, funny, satirical, moving thing, fine music and so forth. They put it down. All men reviewed it, incidentally. And uh, I thought it was a lovely piece. Now, ordinarily, if I were a commercial, I would have closed it because of the first two weeks, because of the reviews, very few people came. I said, let's run it. I think there are a lot of people, there are a lot of women in New York, first of all, that don't have men. We know there are thousands and thousands of women that are concerned with this problem. And we kept pushing it, and suddenly began to build up. We had talks with the, company, with the audience, and now it began, it began to do 70 percent, 80, 90, then it began to sell out. It became, now it's doing 100% capacity. We moved it to a circle in the square. It had a $40,000 advance in one week. Now here's a show that got bad, bad notices from the critics. See? I'm thinking of another show, and that's Runaways. The Runaways, that's Runaways has been struggling as a show because it's a serious show. Most, most shows on Broadway don't deal with serious issues. And uh, they're just you know, good, uh, or good or bad entertainment, as the case may be. But Runaways, again, was a, dealt with a serious subject. And, uh, how can you afford to keep that running to half empty houses? I, I can't. It's not half empty. It's two thirds, two thirds full. Full. <laughs> uh, but we've been we've been absorbing that money as we do with other things. I mean, we're not in, in, in it for profit. We like to make money to to the to support the other things that we do. But I felt that show will be run. I don't think it'll run much longer, because we can't afford to drop that much money. That much money. What we can't is, afford it. What is your next chorus line? Where will those funds come from on an ongoing basis? Do I'm you have something you, in the works? 
uh, a play that might generate that kind of income? You never think that way. That's not looking for that for that man that's you, that you were looking for all your life. That one man is. You have be, to tell everyone. Well, Joe. well I'm just mm -hmm. telling you. Right. <laughs> that expectation is foolish. You can't run an institution on that that, that that hit. Can you imagine saying that to the United States government? or any kind of institution that the, we must get a hit the next time around, otherwise you How won't survive. How about the Umbrellas of Sherbrooke? I love that show. Uh, I, don't, I hope it's a hit, but it, I love it so much, I don't, I don't care what it is, but I mean, it's really a good show. And yet it's a it's small... A musical. It's, it's a musical work. Yes, I have several musicals. I have the one with my, that Mike Nichols is directing. I would love to see that show succeed on Broadway because it would be the first Hispanic, really uh, major Hispanic music and the Hispanic actors written by Hispanic... And what is Hispanic. the name of that? It's called Sancocho, what which means a stew. Yes. It was originally called Mondongo, but we changed it. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you later <laughs> on. But anyway, it was, it was, uh, I'd like to see that succeed, but I don't, you can't base your economics and survival on the, on the, where the show's What's gonna the make it What's the most interesting time. development in the theater today? I, uh, the reason I can't answer that question, I'm not sure there's anything that's interesting, that's really, that, that's a development that's of real, any real interest. And I don't want to be uh, pompous or anything else, but, I mean, to start a black Hispanic company is pretty interesting. Uh, to to do, a, do a black Hispanic musical is quite interesting. To do uh, an adaptation of uh, Bulgakov's The Master and Margarita, with, uh, which, was and which Andre Serban directed, and we ran it just for, for two weeks, and uh, it was a really f inflamed the theater, and didn't take it off because we, can't, we, we couldn't afford to run any longer. That's very interesting. To do a new play by, 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 by Tom Babe called Fathers and Sons, and get Richard Chamberlain, who's played all pretty boys, to play a marvelous character role to me, he was terrific in it, that's very, very interesting. To do uh, drinks before dinner, that's very, very interesting. I have about eight new plays, and four by women and four by men. There's just been more women playwrights coming out. Uh, to get interesting, interested directors. We have, we have music down there. We have different kinds of films. That's all very interesting. But any new developments in the theater, I don't see any new developments in the theater. Is it an old story, that uh, cliche that we hear about every four years, that there's no material? Is that true again, or is there... There's new material? No material. Every four years? Every year. <laughs> no, there's plenty of material. There's yes. a lot of interesting material. But you say, when I say, you, you say something interesting, I, mean, uh, I say a cutting edge, something that changes the theater. And uh, I'm, I'm, that's what I aim for constantly, but I haven't seen that around too much. Here and there, I'll tell you, there's an interesting young group that's starting in, in Brooklyn, uh, BAM, uh, called the Dodgers. They call themselves the Dodgers. In the and, new Dodger uh, Theater. And, yeah, De and Des McCannif, who's both a writer, we're doing one of his plays, directed this, this work by an English uh, writer called Keefe. Uh, I thought that was excellent. I, 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 th I, saw something, I saw something new and fresh there. To me, that's interesting, see. I feel, boy, there, not only that, there was skill and there was taste, you know. And I felt that, that company's going to go someplace. Of all the work you've done, what has given you the greatest pleasure? Well, actually, I find most of my pleasure in other people's work. Although the one, personally, my, the thing I, I enjoyed most doing was directing Hamlet uh, some years ago, which called The Naked Hamlet, which I tore the play apart, having known it so well. And, and you tear it apart like you do with a lover, and, uh, and created a kind of an interesting uh, insight into the play. I, I found that the most interesting work I'd done, personally. Do you have any plans to direct anything this I coming almost, I almost directed, started to direct Coriolanus this morning, and I looked at my schedule and decided, no, I can't. Because the director who's directing is overwhelmed with this, with this job. And I thought, well, I'm going well, to go around. Would you like I, to I do, do that, that again? Uh, see, liking is one thing, but what if you were the president of the United States and someone said, wouldn't you like to uh, do this? The guy says, yes, I'd like to, but I have to run an organization. I mean, I just could barely get away to come to this, to this, to this well, I'm situation. I'm glad that you did. What would you like it's to be doing in 10 years from now? Um, um, let me see. I really don't know. I think uh, something better than I'm doing now. So I think it'll be better and it'll be different, and I think it'll be much smarter. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe it'd be nice to have a good company, a first-rate first -rate company of black and white actors and Hispanic actors, really a, what you call a composite of what American culture is like, and get the best people together to do, to do plays. We have ample evidence of the best today. Thank you, Joe Papp, for being pleasure. with us. Thank you, audience, for being with us, too. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein.